While I was doing my daily press review last week and being unable to find anything compelling to talk about, I stumbled upon a minor piece of news that inspired the following Pindaric flight. But follow me, I promise it'll be worth it. The news I'm talking about is the resignation of former economy minister Daishiro Yamagiwa and the appointment of Shigeyuki Goto as his successor. As you might already know in detail if you watch my other videos, the Kishida administration is plagued by a scandal regarding the ties between what is amounting to be a vast majority of LDP members and the controversial cult called the Unification Church. Kishida indeed is trying all he can to show the public opinion he's moving firmly and honestly about his party ties with said cult, but apparently no one is buying it. Kishida is always acting in hindsight after a cabinet member's ties are discovered by the press. And that doesn't really make for a good leader. To paraphrase what Masato Kamikubo, a political science professor at Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto, stated, unless they disclose their relations to the church ahead of the leaks and act accordingly to regain the public trust, it will be just one scandal after the other. But the real news here is the momentary force and inquisitiveness of the Japanese media. As a matter of fact, Yamagiwa revealed his ties to the church only after reporters questioned him about it, which to us it might seem an obvious question to ask as a reporter, but in Japan this is all but guaranteed. Let's take a step back. First of all, I'd like to clarify that I'll be talking about political and investigative journalism. I have no idea if what I'm about to say applies to the other forms of reporting, although I'm inclined to think that for the most part it would. And second, take a look at this. This is an article published on the Asahi Shimbun by Hirayama Ari, and it talks about how the city council of Hino has decided in a special session not to charge the mayor $1,700,000 for the illegal construction of a route used for garbage collection. But the topic isn't important. Look at the structure of the article. The first paragraph basically sums up the entire text, concisely stating what the topic is and what's the news. The other three paragraphs are, respectively, an expansion on the news itself, adding only some tiny, almost irrelevant facts, a reporting on the opinions of unnamed people, and a little context on what happened before. As you can see, there are no insights or opinion whatsoever, and the same goes for most newspaper articles. If you compare that to an American newspaper article, which usually starts with three paragraphs of context and then the actual news, followed by a lot of opinion, the Japanese text is for sure more readable and direct, but lacks anything that would indicate the presence of a human being typing on a keyboard. This structure is basically the template for any news article covering Japanese politics, both of local and national relevance. And if you think it makes the reporting superfluous, well, you're not the only ones. In most cases, reporters limit themselves to transcribe announcements from the authorities, their statements and declarations of intent. This situation is a result of many different factors, and even though it's a fascinating topic, it's very complicated and extensive. And since I'm not an expert, and this video is supposed to be short, I'll try and give you a comprehensive overview of the main problems and organize them into a timeline. Let's start by saying that press freedom in Japan is not as bad as in many other Asian countries. Japanese journalists work in a relatively safe environment when it comes to their physical well-being. To be even clearer, they aren't at risk of being beaten, killed, or unceremoniously imprisoned for going against who's in power. Nonetheless, according to Reporters Without Borders, Japan now disturbingly ranks 71st out of 180 countries when it comes to freedom of press. Reporters Without Borders is a French-based non-profit NGO who keeps track of press freedom issues internationally, and every year they release their Press Freedom Index which ranks all countries from the most virtuous to the worst and illustrates their various problematics. As I just said, in 2022 Japan slid to 71st, down from 67th in 2021, and even more surprisingly, from 11th in 2010. The reasons for this are many, and I will follow their guidelines to examine them in detail. I also want to precise that much of what I'll say I've learned from a beautiful publication on the Cambridge University Press by Jeff Kingston. Give it a look. Japan's mainstream media, both newspapers and broadcasters, are owned by five major media conglomerates, the most famous of which are the Yomiuri, fiercely conservative and nationalist on the right side of the political spectrum, 
and the Asahi, more left-leaning and liberal, to the extent to which a media corporation can be liberal in one of the most conservative countries in the world. News websites seem to be less influential than traditional media, considering also that both Yomiuri and Asahi have the highest physical copies circulation in the whole world. Aside from these companies, websites and independent journalists struggle a lot to rise to relevance. And that is mostly because Japanese journalism is access-driven. Access journalism, as opposed to watchdog journalism, prioritizes access to the news over journalistic integrity and objectivity, and therefore is filtered by the authority. In our case, the filter takes the form of the so-called kishakurabu, meaning reporters' club, which are press rooms organized by either the government or local authorities, open only to a set list of members. This list usually includes only reporters from the five major news corporations, and excludes smaller newspapers and magazines, freelance reporters, and all the foreign media. Therefore, journalists are discouraged to write articles criticize whomever's in charge, in order to avoid losing access to first-hand information. And outside the Kisha Club, there's little to no journalistic activity, because the little relevance of independent reporters allows public figures and authorities to simply avoid confronting them. This climate and the traditional mentality of lifelong employment in the same company often induce reporters to self-censorship or exercising excessive caution, in order to build trust with their sources and possibly get a promotion. And because of this lapdog attitude, journalism in Japan is also plagued by misogyny and sexism. Given the fact that Japanese society itself is still far behind for what concerns women rights, sexual liberation, equality in workplace and laws against sexual harassment and assault, the journalism industry is considered one of the most sexist environments in Japan. It seems to be the norm that female reporters are induced to accept sexual harassment from public figures in order to get closer to them and gather information most of which, though usually, doesn't get published, in order to avoid retaliations and or until other newspapers go public with it. Even in the wake of the Me Too movement, sexual harassment stays endemic, and the press doesn't usually jump on the stories unless they get too big to ignore, as it happened with Shiori Ito in 2017. Shiori Ito is a journalist who, she recounts, in 2015, was drugged and assaulted by Noriyuki Yamaguchi, Shinzo Abe's biographer. After denouncing the event to the police, she endured various humiliations and was advised to forget that ever happened, lest she wanted to destroy her own career. In spite of this, and other people backing up her version of the events, on June 2015, an arrest warrant is issued to Yamaguchi was halted by Itaru Nakamura, a close confidant to both Abe and Yamaguchi, and, at the time, acting chief of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. The mainstream media coverage of this awful series of events was close to none, at least until she denounced the facts at a press conference years later, sparking an international backlash against Japanese authorities. This and other cases should have put the spotlight on the severe and endemic problem that is sexism in Japanese work culture, but to this day, and to the extent of my knowledge, media coverage remains scarce, another symptom of how their investigative journalism seems to have grinded to a halt. Other than sexism, we also have to talk about the economic and legal situations behind journalism. As in most other developed countries, the circulation of newspapers in Japan has suffered a steady decline since 2012. This is also reflected in other kind of once popular publications, such as weekly and monthly manga magazines. Japanese editorial companies are having a tough time, surprisingly, I'd say, when it comes to switching from physical to digital, with subscription models that don't offer interesting products at interesting prices. On top of this, the legal environment for publishers is severely unfavorable, with weak legal protections for journalists and a massive spike in financial penalties imposed on them. And being media companies, businesses first and watchdogs later, Journalists are encouraged to self-censorship as a risk management strategy, and as a good nationalist revisionist does when he's in positions of power, during his governing years, Abe enacted various laws making life more difficult for every member of the fourth estate who wouldn't comply with the government's requests. 
In 2013, he passed the so-called State Special Secrets Law, allowing bureaucrats to bury documents up to 60 years with little oversight, while introducing harsh penalties for anyone accessing these documents or the government sources. Harsh as in up to 10 years in prison, completely ridiculous for a first world country. More recently, in 2020, Abe reduced the number of member journalists allowed at the Kisha Club, and in 2021, the government passed a vaguely phrased regulation which restricts the public from accessing areas near defense facilities and infrastructures deemed of national security interest, such as the Fukushima plant. This tough legal climate also makes it incredibly difficult for any independent journalist to thrive and be relevant, adding to the lack of diversity in publications. And in fact, the Fukushima incident story is once again relevant to one very interesting case study in Japanese journalism, which is the recent years of the Asahi Shimbun and its clashes with none other than Shinzo Abe. As I said before, the Asahi is a newspaper with a liberal left-leaning stance on most issues. In 2011, after the triple catastrophe in Fukushima, the Asahi created an investigative team of journalists called Prometheus, who worked on uncovering all the inconvenient truths of mismanagement, complacency, and cost-cutting measures that imperiled the public safety, publishing all of this in a series of reports called The Promethean Trap. Aside from instantly becoming the target of the so-called nuclear village, that is, all the pro-nuclear forces in the industry, politics, government, unions, and academia, in 2012, Abe got back in office as prime minister, along with the rise of a nationalist right, creating a climate of mistrust and hostility towards journalists, and singling the Azahi out multiple times for its coverage. As I said before, in 2013, Abe unsuspiciously passes that state special secrets law, and in 2014, he appointed a crony with no media background to the head of the NHK, the Japanese national broadcast and the second largest public broadcast in the world. The crony established a regime of total adherence to the government's narrative, and the same year will proceed to launch an attack against the Asahi in order to discredit it, along with other pro-Abe media like the Yomiuri Corporation and other neo-nationalist group. All of this with the government's encouragement. The case's belly in this case was, at first, an article of the Hazahi covering the tragedy of the comfort women, a system of sexual slavery and institutionalized mass rape in countries occupied by Japan during World War II, a topic that has always been very dear to the revisionist right in Japan, which always denied such things ever happened even in face of undeniable historical proof. A second pretext to attack the Hazahi came a few months later, when it published a scoop regarding workers fleeing the Fukushima power plant through a testimony from plant manager Masao Yoshida that was withheld from the public and in this way going against the official narrative that wants the workers, renamed the Fukushima 50, selflessly doing whatever was required to contain the disaster. So, you see what happened here? The moment a controversy broke out, the rest of the media lashed out at the Azahi and tried to delegitimize it in support of the government, and in the process betraying journalistic integrity to seek legitimization from the government and continued to be granted access at the Kisha clubs. Along with them, powerful pressure groups such as nuclear-related industries and politicians, and new nationalist groups ganged up together to repress a series of reports on the government's wrongdoing. This easily explains the falling of press freedom in the ratings of Reporters Without Borders, which specifically referenced the growing control of large industrial groups as a reason for its ranking. The aftermath of this saw the Asahi issuing a public apology, retracting 30 years of articles regarding comfort women and the, and the article about the Fukushima 50, and firing most of the journalists in the Prometheus investigative team. Nonetheless, Later on, the Azahi went back on the offensive, reporting on two cronism scandals involving Abe's close friends, one who got an 86% discount on a land deal, and another who got the first permission issued in half a century to open a veterinary school, respectively Yasunori Kagoike and Kotaro Kake. Because of the already dire polls and little public trust in the government's response to this, 
Abe called snap elections at the end of 2017 and secured his third term before the opposition could organize to pose a real threat to his presidency, and retail some more in 2020, with the reduction of journalists allowed at Kisha clubs, and in 2021 with the already mentioned law banning the public from areas near some government-related facilities. And this takes us back to our time and the beginning of the video. After Shinzo Abe's assassination by Tetsuya Yamagami, the latter uncovered the proverbial Pandora's vase by citing as his motive Abe's ties to the Unification Church cult. And surprisingly enough, the Japanese media started acting as an actual investigation force to be reckoned with, uncovering more and more ties between LDP lawmakers and the cult, and causing Kishida to repeatedly dismiss ministers. It seems so that there is still a cinder of hope burning for the power of the fourth estate in Japan. Let's hope that trend will continue and that we will be able to witness a rebirth of Japanese journalism in the years to come. That's it for today. Thank you so much for following me in this long and complicated discussion. This was an experimental video I made after a dreadful slow news week. Please tell me in the comments if you'd like to see more content like this in the future. And as always, thank you for watching and if you liked the video, please leave a comment, like and subscribe. See ya!